Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Triangulation is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Triangulation, episode 339, recorded March 16th, 2018, for air March 23rd, 2018. Melissa Schilling, author of Quirky. This episode of Triangulation is brought to you by ZipRecruiter. Hiring? ZipRecruiter has revolutionized how you do it. Their technology identifies people with the right experience and invites them to apply to your job. Try it for free today at ZipRecruiter.com slash triangulation. And by Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Home plays a big role in your life, and that's why Quicken Loans created Rocket Mortgage. It lets you apply simply and understand the entire mortgage process fully so you can be confident that you're getting the right mortgage for you. Get started at rocketmortgage.com slash triangulation. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Triangulation. This is the show where we get to sit down with people who, forward thinkers in the technology space, people who are really kind of dissecting this technology world that we live in, in new and interesting ways. I'm Jason Howell. One thing that I really love about doing the show, being able to hop in here uh, from time to time, is that I get to read a lot of books that maybe maybe wouldn't have been my first instinct to because there's so many great books out there right you can't you can't read them all uh but then you you come across these great reads and i gotta tell you quirky which is the book that we're gonna be talking about today uh is fantastic it's like eight nine maybe ten history books all combined into one that de really goes into depth as far as what makes serial breakthrough innovators so effective what what makes them different from the rest of us that you know that just kind of look at, at at the things that they're able to do in awe and appreciate the fact that they're able to repeat time and time again uh creating these world changing amazing things and joining us is of course the author of quirky it's melissa schilling professor at NYU, also a researcher, and which is completely apparent because this this book feels very well researched. Uh, Melissa Schilling, welcome to the Thank show. You. Thank you for, for joining us today. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Absolutely. So, so I should I should read through uh, kind of the 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 entire titles: quirky, the remarkable story of the traits, foibles, and genius of breakthrough innovators who changed the world, and. You actually teach a course on innovation strategy. I think my first, my yeah. first, my first uh, question on that is how, like, I, I have to imagine the the thesis, the idea for this book, kind of came from your teachings through your class. How do they how do they relate? How did that uh, all start? Absolutely. So uh, I've taught innovation strategy for about 20, a little bit over 20 years. And I also have a textbook that's uh, the strategic management of technological innovation. And when you have a textbook, you have to revise that textbook every three years or so. So you're constantly going out and reviewing the research that's been done. What have we learned? What do we know? A textbook isn't just you, right? A textbook is an amalgamation of the field. So I felt like I knew the field pretty well. And then in 2010, when Steve Jobs was looking decidedly thin, I had a lot of students coming up to me and saying, what's going to happen? Is How much of that magic of Apple is in the man and how much of it is in the organization? Is it embedded in the routines and the structure? Is there a successor? Or is it just going to disappear if we lose Steve Jobs? And at the heart of that question is also another question people are really asking, which is, how do I do that myself? How can I be like that? Could I be like that? And I was perplexed that that answer, the answer to that question really wasn't in the research. It wasn't in the psychology and creativity research, and it certainly wasn't in the innovation research. And in part, it's because that question isn't well suited to our research norms. So in my field, for instance, we like to have big samples that we can run statistics on. We like them to be random samples. And a big sample like that is not it's very unlikely to have someone like Elon Musk or Steve Jobs or Marie Curie in that sample at all. And then the other way you could go, you could go with lab studies, which are very popular in psychology, but you're also not going to get Steve Jobs and Elon Musk into the lab. So it really just not was well suited to doing the kind of research that we can publish in our top journals, which had made it a question that's a little bit neglected. There'd been a handful of work on it here and there, but not that, not that much. Really didn't have the answer to that question that people were asking me. So just for my own 
edification, I guess, I started studying Steve Jobs, the man. And I had already studied Apple for years because I've been teaching the Apple case in class and I'd written about Apple in my dissertation. But now I wanted to understand Steve as a person. I wanted to know what drove him, what his talents were, what his beliefs were, what experiences shaped him, what his, what his parents were like. So I just just fully indulged myself and started studying Steve Jobs as a person. And one of the most remarkable things that happened very early on is that I noticed he had very strange commonalities with another innovator I'd already written a case about, which is Dean Kamen. Uh, Dean Kamen is the man who invented the first, world's first portable uh, drug diffusion pump, which completely revolutionized diabetes care. He also invented the world's first portable dialysis machine, a bunch of prosthetic arms, and a wheelchair that can climb stairs. But what you know him for is for inventing the Segway personal transporter. <laughs> so he is actually a really unusual guy. And some of the ways that he is unusual are very similar to the ways that Steve Jobs was unusual. And that really struck a chord in me. It made me wonder how many innovators would have these unusual traits. And was there a connection between these traits and innovation? Could we connect them via science? So I ended up deciding to put together a multiple case study research project and study eight innovators. I took myself out of the selection process by setting up a protocol that would just scrape them from the, the lists of most famous inventors and most famous innovators uh, with a bunch of criteria. And I just dedicated about six years to studying these innovators. And it turned out they had a remarkable amount in common. Some of the things they had in common are things we hadn't really examined as innovation scholars. And yet when you look at them really closely and you watch how they worked for these innovators, you understand the mechanism that causes these characteristics or traits to lead to innovation. And a lot of them are ones we can tap into even if we don't have that trait. So that's really cool. Yeah, one of the things that uh, that you point out early on in the book that really struck me is I, I feel like, and especially in the last couple of years, I feel like I've had these moments where I'm like, you know, I come up with a random idea out of thin air and I'm like, you know, if I had the right something, this would be a million dollar idea. I'm not sure what the something yeah. is, but if I knew how to take this to the next level, uh, you know, I, I guess that would make me an innovator to some degree. Um, I mean, is that to say that the right drive, the right motivation, anybody could be an innovator at this level? Or is it really like they have something inherent about them that's different from the rest of us? Yeah. So the first thing I'd say is a lot of us have ideas. Um, the innovators I studied had particularly interesting, big, bold, heterodox ideas for some reasons that I can talk about as we go on in the segment. But but ideas are pretty common. But the problem is most ideas are very ephemeral. We just, we think about them and we think, wouldn't it be cool if, and then we lose it because we're busy and most of us aren't driven to, to dedicate our lives to pursuing those ideas. And so when you see a breakthrough idea come to fruition, there's almost always three major pieces to it. There's the heterodox idea, the unusual, creative, bold idea. There's in intense amount of effort and persistence. And a lot of what I end up studying in the book is what drives that intense effort and persistence. And then there's also always situational factors like being in the right time, right place, having access to the right resources, uh, being in an era when opportunity was ripe to happen. So those three things have to come together. Um, now, in terms of the nature versus nurture question, one thing I will say is that all of the innovators I studied turn out to be in, extremely intelligent, like really, really intelligent. All probably would have had genius IQs, all had exceptional memories, all were noted for their memories. Uh, at least two of them had photographic memory. Uh, so those things are hard to imitate, right? Mm -hmm. That sort of photographic memory is hard for us to imitate. <laughs> but a lot of the other things are actually learnable or imitable. Yeah, I mean, coming you can't just teach yourself how, how to have a photographic memory, like, <laughs> and, no. or at least from my understanding, it's the kind of thing that, that you're, that you are basically born with and it happens, you know, hopefully it serves you in life, but I think for a lot of, yeah. for some people, it can work in the negative as well. Um, what, what about this, this quirky quality? Obviously your book is called Quirky and that's because in your research and in the stories that you tell about these innovators, they all have a very kind of particular element of their personality personality that, you know, really kind of sets them apart from the rest. Some would call it quirky. Some would call it maybe strange or weird or isolated, yeah. whatever it is. Why, why right. do they all share that? Is that, is that necessary? So, yeah, the, the, the quirky title became because they all do share a weirdness. And uh, one of the things I end up talking about in the book is that 
weirdness is actually really important because any breakthrough idea, any idea that's going to change the world that hasn't already changed the world, it's going to be perceived as weird. It's going to be perceived as strange and maybe unreasonable, maybe impossible. And people who pursue ideas like that are often people who themselves are going to seem weird. But but I'd say the trait that, that probably is most connected to this is separateness. And this was really interesting because I wasn't looking for this. I, I didn't think about separateness before going into this research project and I hadn't seen anything really about it in, in the research. Uh, and I could talk more about that if you want, but basically, seven out of the eight seven out of the eight innovators I studied had this really marked sense of separateness, meaning that they felt detached from the social world. Uh, maybe they felt like they didn't belong, or maybe they just were tended to be loners. So, sometimes they were uh, ostracized for reasons beyond their control. Uh, more than. Edison was deaf, so that created a separation for him. But because they were separate, first of all, they weren't as ex as exposed to the norms of conventional wisdom. They weren't um, they weren't sort of socialized to reach consensus like everybody else. It also made them often believe that the rules of the world didn't apply to them, so they would reject society's rules. So if you think about Steve Jobs, for instance, he often didn't wear shoes and he didn't wear deodorant. He didn't shower very often, and he would stare intensely at people without blinking and which violates a pretty strong social norm. <laughs> he didn't put a license plate on his car. He parked in the handicap spot every every single day. And that was because the rules of the world didn't apply to him. That ends up being enormously valuable for deciding you're going to pursue something that other people think is unrealistic or isn't the right thing to pursue or might be impossible. And he became a person who fought fiercely for things that other people didn't necessarily think was the right strategy. Uh, and it was that's that's one of the reasons he was able to achieve so many things that we remember him for. Um, and Albert Einstein actually wrote at length about this. Like Albert Einstein said, he loved humanity, but he felt detached from people. And he even felt detached from his family. And he said that that might not have made him very genial, but it made him an independent thinker. And it was one of the major reasons that he was able to cast aside a lot of the Newtonian uh, rules that were holding back other academics and scholars. And as a result, he completely revolutionized physics because he felt like its rules didn't apply to him. Yeah, yeah, it's fascinating. So I, I guess we should list off here just, just real quick the eight subjects that you did choose for this book. And mind you, the, the, your book, you also go into subjects outside of these, but these seem to be the, the major focus. Albert Einstein, Benjamin Franklin, Elon Musk, Dean Kamen, as you mentioned, Nikola Tesla, uh, Mary Curie, which I, I was fascinated to learn more about Mary Curie, um, Thomas Edison, and then Steve Jobs. And uh, we have to take a, a, just a quick break to uh, thank the sponsor. And then we're going to come back and kind of talk about how each of these subjects fits into the, the main characteristics that you that you lay out in the book. And, uh, you know, those of you watching and listening, you can, you know, have, have a pad and, and pencil ready to write down the things that you share with them and maybe the things that you don't. Who knows? Maybe you too could be a serial uh, innovator of your, <laughs> of your own. Uh, but before we dive into that, let's thank the sponsor of today's episode of Triangulation. And that is ZipRecruiter. If you're hiring, if you own a business, you know the value of finding the right people. And that is what ZipRecruiter is all about. Every business needs great people. It's a pretty common trait between all businesses. And you probably need a better way to find them. Something better than posting your job online, which is what everybody does, and then just waits for things to happen, prays for the right people to see it. ZipRecruiter knew there was a smarter way. Uh, so they built a platform to find the right job candidates for you, to make it easy for you to find them, in fact. ZipRecruiter learns what you're looking for. It identifies people with the right experience and then invites them to apply for your job. These invitations have revolutionized how you find your next hire. In fact, 80% of employers who post a job on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate through the site in just a single day. That's all you have to, like, that's the most mental bandwidth you have to devote to it. Probably, if you're posting on ZipRecruiter, it's going to be pretty easy, especially compared to the rest. And ZipRecruiter doesn't stop there. They even spotlight the strongest applications that you receive so you never miss a great match. They point it out for you. The right candidates are out there. They are. The internet's a big place, and there are a lot of capable people out there. ZipRecruiter is going to be how you find them. Businesses of all size trust ZipRecruiter for their hiring needs. And right now, you can try ZipRecruiter for free. That's right, free 
All you have to do is go to ZipRecruiter.com slash triangulation. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash triangulation. And one more time for good measure, ZipRecruiter.com slash triangulation. ZipRecruiter is the smartest way to hire. And we thank ZipRecruiter for their support of triangulation. So uh, let's kind of dive into some of these characteristics that you spell out in your book and uh, kind of see, you know, what they share. It, it struck me that out of the eight subjects that you that you focus on, I wouldn't say that there there was one characteristic that all eight of them had guaranteed. Like there was a little bit of well, fluidity there. there. Which is the one? I'm Actually, curious. there's two, but the one that's probably most important is they all had really, really high self-efficacy. Oh, yes. Uh, yeah. So, you want me to talk about what self-efficacy is real quick? A absolutely. Yeah, let's dive into that. That's, okay. that's, that's absolutely perfect for the top. Okay, so self-efficacy is a type of task-related self-confidence that is your belief in your ability to overcome obstacles to achieve your goals. Uh, a person could maybe not appear to have generalized self-confidence. Like if you met Marie Curie, maybe you wouldn't think she was very confident, but she had incredibly high self-efficacy, as did every single innovator I looked at. And you could there was lots and lots of ways to see it and measure it. And what self-efficacy does is it completely changes your notion of what's possible. Because if you fundamentally believe you will overcome obstacles to achieve your goals, then when you hit hurdles and obstacles, instead of having them knock you back and make you think, well, maybe this isn't going to work or maybe discouraging you and thinking you should quit, these people just thought they have to dig in hard and what looks like risk tolerance, because they would take on incredibly projects that are incredibly risky, is uh, actually just a completely different calculation of risk. Because if you believe you can overcome just about any obstacle, the risk is lower for you in your mind. And uh, this is one of the major things that drives innovators to take on things that other people think are impossible. And one of the one of the great things about self-efficacy, there's a bunch of great things about self-efficacy, but one of the great things about it is that uh, it'll not only make you more innovative, but it'll often make you more productive in just about any job. It'll often enhance your sense of well-being. It's a very powerful and valuable trait, and it's one that we can learn, and it's one we can cultivate in other people, and we can cultivate it in our children. We can cultivate it in our employees. Uh, it, it's definitely one of the characteristics we should learn more about and utilize every single day. Yeah, it, sh it definitely shows a, uh, a maturity in thinking when, when you are able to approach a task like this and really have that just extreme confidence, which is uh, what you called out in the book. Uh, however, that trait can also be interpreted uh, by many as rude. Steve Jobs would be a, a prime yeah. example of that, right? Like he's very directed. Right. He had high confidence in what he was able to do, but often that came across as being, uh, well, rude or, or rash. Right. Or hubris. Right. Yeah. And, you know, if you don't succeed, people will call it hubris and arrogance right. and maybe even naivete. And what's interesting is take someone like Nikola Tesla. Nikola Tesla had incredibly grand aspirations and people called him a visionary back in a time when that word was an insult. <laughs> mm -hmm. So visionary hasn't always been a positive term. They thought he was a dreamer and delusional. But then he came through on virtually every promise that he made. And and uh, yeah, I mean, you can't even imagine what the world would be like if he hadn't. I'll give you a great example. When he was 14, he told his he saw a postcard with a sketch of Niagara Falls, and he told his father, "I'm going to build a water wheel that harnesses uh, the energy of that." that great waterfall. I'm going to, I'm going to build a way to capture that energy and, and turn it into power. And his father, you know, said, yeah, sure, son, that's, that's great. Good for you. You're not really believing him. And sure enough, he actually did build, you know, he built the great big AC power system mm -hmm. at Niagara Falls, which was the first power system to shoot power hundreds of miles across the country, you know, up until that time, power had only been transmitted a couple of miles. It was weak. Uh, but the AC power systems that he developed were much more powerful. And we still use those AC power systems today. Uh, he also invented wireless communication. And for years, that was attributed to Guglielmo Marconi, Guglielmo Marconi. And then only after Nikola Tesla's death, there was a big patent case involving the, the Navy. And they ended up revealing that all the work was actually based on Nikola Tesla's Oh, that's fascinating. Another part of the Nikola Tesla story that that kind of struck me kind of ties into this idea of uh, of of luck, let's say, or, or right place, right time when when Nikola Tesla was 
born. He was born during an, a lightning storm, right? Yeah, I mean, which is such right. a crazy coincidence. Or was it a coincidence? Like, you know, is there something greater at work? Who knows? Um, but regardless, it seems like with, with all of these people, like to be able for one person to say, I'm going to replicate the success of that one person. There is an element of luck of right place, right time. And you, you point that out yeah. in the book as well. Right, right. Uh, definitely timing mattered. And you could have done a whole book just on people who emerged during the computer revolution, for instance. I didn't want to do that. So I tried to, after I had scraped the list and I had a set of people, I tried to pick people across different time periods and across different technologies. But, you know, the computer revolution made a lot of tech, a lot of breakthroughs ripe for the happening, as did electrification era. So, for instance, I have Thomas Edison and Nikola Tesla, but I didn't put in Alexander Graham Bell because we would have, you know, it's more people from the same era. Um, you know, Marie Curie's story is interesting because her story really poignantly exhibits both the upsides and downsides of a time. So, for instance, she was this brilliant girl who taught herself physics and math and chemistry, a very dedicated student, well ahead of her grade level all through school. But she was growing up in what we now call Poland, but it was occupied by Russia at that time. And, and women weren't allowed to go to college. Like women weren't admitted into university in Poland during that time. And they weren't allowed into college in most of Europe. Uh, so here's a woman who's brilliantly smart, but women weren't ad expected to go into science during that time. And she wanted to be a scientist. So she scraped together funds from being a governess and managed to travel to Paris so that she could attend the Sorbonne, one of the few universities that did admit women, and ultimately got her PhD there and went on to become the first woman to win a Nobel Prize, the first person of any gender to win two Nobel Prizes, uh, and the Nobel Prizes in different fields, in fact. And her daughter would go on to become the second woman to win a Nobel Prize. So a truly remarkable person. But I mentioned that the downside of timing, the downside was that women weren't really accepted into science. So she was, she was discriminated against. She wasn't allowed to present her papers in the academy. They didn't actually want to give her the Nobel Prize at first. They wanted to give it to her husband, Pierre Curie. So she really faced a lot of uphill battles. On the other hand, the upside of time is that she was pursuing her PhD right after Röntgen had discovered his mysterious rays and Becquerel had discovered mysterious rays. So she decided to study mysterious rays and subsequently discovered radium and radioactivity as a atomic property. So she benefited from timing as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there was a, there was a lot about Mary Curie in the chapter that focused on separateness, which yeah. seems like a very, you know, yet another very common trait. Einstein, uh, you went into detail in that area, but Mary Curie socially isolated. How important of a, of a factor is that to to the majority of these innovators? Do they need that time, that that kind of isolated time to allow them to foster their ideas without that influence from other people? Is that why that's so necessary? Yeah, yeah let's talk about that for a minute. Um, you know, Marie Curie, the, the reason why, the main reason I think why she felt a sense of separateness is that as a child, her mother died of tuberculosis and her sister died of typhoid and she spiraled into a chronic depression just existed in a state of depression for a very long time. And she would escape into her schoolwork and study and didn't want to have any social activities and didn't identify with the other kids of her, her age in social activities, felt awkward around them. Um, and as a result, she didn't fit in. But because she didn't fit in, she didn't strive to fit in. So when she went to pursue her PhD and everybody looked at her like, what are you doing here? You're a woman trying to become a scientist. Who do you think you are? She just ignored them. And that was hugely important. And, you know, later on when the Nobel Committee said, uh, we don't want you to come pick up your prize, she just ignored them, basically, and just put her head down and worked. So that feeling separate was, was super important uh, in terms of her ability to pursue something even in the face of criticism. But the other thing that you're, you're seeing there is that, and you see this also with, with, with almost all the innovators, is that having time to work alone and think alone it gives you a chance to form your own associations about how the world works. It gives you time to discover what you find intrinsically interesting and important. And it's just going to make you a more independent thinker. And I think uh, one of the things this really affected me personally was that 
you know, I have kids and I have a lot of friends with kids. And one of the trends right now is to schedule the heck out of your kids. Yes, it is. So, <laughs> you know, your kids are in music class and language class and they're doing soccer or glee club. And we're so worried about having our kids being, you know, so fully skilled up so that they have a great college application and to have lots of team activities so that they know how to negotiate and be charismatic and all these things that sometimes what we lose sight of is the fact that kids need downtime to think about who they are and what they believe and uh, that's not screen time because when you're looking at a screen you're re screen you're reacting to somebody else's creative idea right yeah. they need time to read and think and write and one of the things that also came through really strongly with this with these innovators that's related to this is that a lot of them were autodidacts they were self-taught even if they went to school so first of all they had a lot less formal education than you'd expect a lot of them chafed with the formal structure of school but they were all in voracious readers and that enabled them to study the things they wanted to study at the depth they wanted and at the rate they wanted and at the format they wanted and they could move across fields when they wanted or they could just drill down into one when they wanted and that was hugely important so many of these people were self-taught and i think it has a lot of implications for how we think about education we, we shouldn't just be counting on classrooms where we've diced up all the topics really evenly and apply them uh, in a standardized fashion to every student people aren't standardized and thank god they're not or we wouldn't get breakthrough ideas yeah it's uh, that's an interesting point um elon musk was one of the one of the examples that really you know kind of struck me from the book as far as being that you know just from an early age reading all the books in the library then going to the encyclopedia because there was nothing else to, to read yes. and and learning from that too and uh, yeah I mean when I think about when I think about my kids one of the struggles or one of the things that we've learned over time is that our initial reaction was to schedule all these things because you want them to be active and you you know you don't want them to be too 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 inactive because when they're inactive maybe they're not learning or maybe they're not experiencing or whatever but you also want them to be bored because when they are bored that's when create true creative thinking can happen once they yes. have the ability to kind of maneuver through that boredom that might take some time but come out the other end and come up with something that they wouldn't have thought of to do and that's that's where this kind of this critical thinking emerges from that that i'm sure sets these innovators apart from everyone else absolutely absolutely yeah. um you know and it's funny that you mentioned elon musk he not only, so he read every book in the library, as you mentioned, and then started in on the encyclopedia. And because he has a photographic memory, he committed large pieces of it to memory. And then he would recite them to his friends or he would recite them to kids at school and they wouldn't like him very much because it doesn't, apparently it doesn't endear you to others to <laughs> recite tracks of the encyclopedia. Yeah, it's, if, you, if you're the know-it-all, yeah, you're not always <laughs> everyone's best friend if you're the know-it-all. <laughs> yeah, so... Well, we see, um, you know, when I first started this project, my impression of Elon Musk was this Tony Stark character because yeah. I had read that John Favreau had based the Tony Stark character in, in Iron Man on Elon Musk. And so I thought he was going to be this playboy socialite kind of guy, but he's not like that at all. You know, and when he was a kid, he was very, he was smaller than the other kids, even though he's a very large man now. Uh, he was very small and he was very nerdy and he was very bullied. And so he would just run home and escape into books every single day and taught himself to program and wrote his first software game by the age of 12. And, you know, today kids might write a software program, write a software game at the age of 12 because there's a YouTube tutorial mm -hmm. and lots of apps that make it easy. But he was doing this in the in the 80s, back when it was, you know, DOS and basic on a monochrome screen. So to have done that is truly remarkable. Blastar, you can actually do do a Google search for Blastar or Elon Musk video game, and there's a uh, there's a, a way that you can play it in your web browser. I played it the other day. I was like, oh yeah, I could totally remember back then getting these magazines and plugging in code and coming up with a simple game like that that someone wrote. I never considered that it could have been Elon Musk's game that he was paid five hundred dollars for. That's awesome. Right, right. Uh, that was one of the, one Sorry. of the early wins that helped build self-efficacy for him. Yeah, yeah, no kidding. Okay, so uh, going back to yeah, there it is. Car now, <laughs> uh, now our now our technical director and producer Carson is playing. We may have lost him uh, with this captivating <laughs> game. It's a little slow moving. I will warn you, Carson, but it's uh, endearing nonetheless. Uh, talking about separateness for a second, it seemed like the one subject in your book that did not 
exhibit this quality was Benjamin Franklin. What what made right. him such an outlier? How, how did he kind of fall outside of this when everyone else was captive to this? Yeah, that's a that's a funny one. So so first I end up noticing, you know, I end up seeing all these signs that these people are very, very separate. And um, and it's not it's not the same thing as introversion, by the way. A lot of them would not be considered introverts. It's something very different from introversion. Uh, but then Benjamin Franklin was very social. At yeah. least he appeared to be very social and he worked at being social. He trained himself to orate and be persuasive. And he, I mean, he actually invested in being charismatic. It was very important to him. And I had a hard time recognizing reconciling that at first. And I think what it ultimately, the one thing that does stand out is that, um, you know, some of Benjamin Franklin's innovations were technological, like some of this discovering some of the fundamental properties of lightning and charting the Gulf Stream. These were these were technological innovations, bifocal glasses. Uh, but then a lot of his innovations were actually social institutions. So, for instance, he created the first public lending library and he helped found University of Pennsylvania and he created volunteer fire departments and street sweeping uh, uh, plans and all of these institutions required cooperation and they wouldn't you would not be able to see whether or not they were beneficial or valuable until they were actually uh, until you actually had people cooperate and employ them so his innovations actually required the cooperation of other people, which means that in order for him to do what he wanted to do, he had to be social and charismatic. Whereas Marie Curie, you know, she discovered radium, it glowed. She didn't need anyone's cooperation. She could hold it up in a, in a vial and you could see it glowing green and its effects were undeniable. So part of what's at play here is the nature of the innovation itself and whether or not you can be alone. I mean, you know, what Einstein did, he could do as a loner, as an independent thinker by himself in a closed room. What Benjamin Franklin did couldn't be done that way. Yeah, yeah, interesting stuff. And also, as part of this, another thing that that kind of struck me from reading through is this idea that working in teams, which is something that, again, going back to you know how schools, you know how we're used to seeing yeah. our schools operate and, and teach our children, working in teams can actually hamper this type of creative thinking. Yeah. Um, how how do you benefit from the value of teams? Uh, while still kind of encouraging this independent thought, this independent discovery, because as you point out in the book, when you when you work in teams, it really changes uh, the majority of people. It changes their dynamic as far as or their their approach to the team. They might have a really great idea, but it might not be a socially acceptable idea, or so far outside of the 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 realm of how we believe a certain system to perform that because it's different, it ends up getting squashed or not even presented because of that team kind of uh, pressure how do you how do you get the benefit of both um, I want to I want to first explain to people so that they understand why teams can really impair creativity because I think sure. that's very very counterintuitive for a lot of us yes uh, you know I work at a business school and here teams are considered you know, teams are the norm we put students into teams all the time and when I first presented this research, you know, I had a lot of shocked looks in, in the room looking at me. Uh, but it turns out there's a ton of psychology research showing that teams don't work the way people thought that they worked. And, and, and we even understand why. So, I mean, here's the thing, brainstorming teams, if you want creative ideas, brainstorming teams are probably the worst. And, and here's why. When people are in a group, first of all, um, they have evaluation apprehension. They don't want to put out their craziest ideas. They don't want to be judged. So they're way more likely to put out an idea that they think other people will like or already have or, or that will be easy to achieve consensus around. So you've lost a lot of novelty there. Uh, you also have what's called production blocking, which means when I'm talking, it's hard for you to talk. It's hard for you to think. So you're not elaborating your idea, you're not getting your idea out, you're getting hijacked onto my train of thought uh, and you're learning about my idea. So, so you're losing novelty there. You're losing both number and novelty of ideas. And then there's another one that actually hasn't been talked about much in the psychology research yet, but you can really see it very clearly when you look at someone like Steve Jobs. And that is that a lot of people are fairly conflict avoidant, which means if they, you put out an idea and other people disagree with it, they'll start making concessions. But through that process of making concessions, you sort of grind down all the corners off of your cool idea and you come to a mediocre compromise. Mm -hmm. So we have lots of evidence that 
in brainstorming teams, you get fewer ideas, you get ideas of less novelty, you even get ideas of less quality. Uh, so some of the solutions now that are being proposed to that is to get people to work on their own first, to be encouraged to think as wild and as big as they want to think, to not be to have no fear of evaluation, which is hard. I mean, you're asking people, don't be afraid of being judged, but sometimes people are gonna be afraid of being judged anyway. Uh, you wanna really lower the, the price of failure and you want people to elaborate those ideas to a pretty good degree, definitely on paper, before you bring them together to talk with other people about them because uh, you don't wanna lose them, right? You don't wanna lose those ideas by bringing people together in a group. The other thing is don't make groups have consensus norms. If you have a group that has several different ideas and they don't agree, split the group up and let subgroups go pursue different ideas. This is what they do at the CERN, uh, at the Large Hadron Collider in Europe because they don't wanna foreclose any possible path that might work. So when groups disagree and they encourage them to disagree, they separate them and let them pursue different paths. We don't all have to come to one solution. Yeah, I, lo I loved that example of how, how CERN um, works behind the scenes. I actually have a, a nephew of mine who, is, who has gone out to CERN, so I've heard some stories from the inside. It's interesting to hear that kind of approach. If we had more of that, I mean, no doubt there would be much more uh, creative and critical thinking uh, happening. And I, I feel like there's a lot of that, that that's kind of missing. Like today's society feels so go, go, go. It feels like make the decision, move on, move on. So this idea of, of taking time alone and to really understand your passions and your interest and your creative thought on tackling a certain task, like it seems to go counter to everything else that's happening in this, in this fast paced society. But um, that's a really great approach. And hey, it, it should be on a t-shirt. If, if CERN's doing it, so should we. <laughs> uh, let's take a quick break and thank the, uh, the sponsor of this episode. Then we'll get back. We've got other other uh, characteristics to dive into. Uh, but before we do that, let's thank the sponsor of this episode of Triangulation. That is Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. If you've gone through this process, if you've done a mortgage process, or maybe you've talked to someone and they've told you any horror stories about just kind of the complication that surrounds setting up a mortgage, it's not the easiest thing in the world, really needs a client-focused technological revolution to bring it into the now, into the digital age. And that's what Quicken Loans uh, created with Rocket Mortgage. Rocket Mortgage gives you the confidence that you need when it comes to buying a home or refinancing your existing home loan. It's simple. It allows you to fully understand all the details and be totally confident that you're getting the right mortgage for you. It's convenient. Their trusted partners allow you to share your financial information with Rocket Mortgage at the touch of a button. They make it super easy for you. It's also powerful. Whether you're looking to buy your first home or your 10th, Rocket Mortgage is able to perform thousands of calculations in seconds. And it's all based on your income, your assets, your credit. They take all that into consideration. Rocket Mortgage will analyze it and offer up the home loan options for which you qualify and then find the one that's just right for you. So you know exactly what you're going to get and you know that it's been poured over and looked at uh, effectively. Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Apply simply. Understand fully mortgage confidently. To get started, all you have to do is go to rocketmortgage.com slash triangulation. That's rocketmortgage.com slash triangulation. Equal housing lender licensed in all 50 states and MLS consumer access .org, number 3030. And we thank Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans for their support. All right. So we're speaking with Melissa Schilling, author of Quirky, a fantastic read, by the way. You can get it on Audible if uh, if if you want to listen to it. I did that as well as read uh, through the book. It, it fit into my schedule perfectly. And the, the read, by the way, on Audible is fantastic. Um, so really enjoyed the audio book. Uh, third characteristic, we haven't really talked. I mean, we've, we've, we've touched on the creative mind uh, a little bit, but let's dive into this a little bit. What is, what is the difference? What is the line between intelligence and and creativity when it, I mean, it's probably a very bl blurry line now that I think about it, but uh, talk yeah. about that a little bit. Yeah, that chapter also talks a lot about, uh, it actually explains a lot of why we associate madness and genius together, which is pretty fascinating. So I'll start with the intelligence part. Uh, you know, and I, and I wanna back up for a second. A, a lot of what's in this chapter was 
really revealed by studying Nikola Tesla very intensely because mm -hmm. Nikola Tesla had traits that it turned out all the other innovators also had, but he had them to such an extreme that you couldn't miss them. So there are things you notice in Tesla that you didn't notice in the others until you went to look for it. Uh, if you if you study no one at all, if, if you had to pick one innovator in this group to study, you'll probably pick Elon because he's so hot right now, but, um, but you should study Nikola Tesla because he is the most extreme of the innovators and in some ways uh, a little bit broken, uh, clearly the most quirky. I'm gonna, so I'm gonna, I backed into this thing on intelligence. They were all very intelligent. That was very, very clear. They, they, a lot of them also had very distinct signs of what we would think of as a dopamine irregularity. So maybe a little bit of elevated dopamine or volatile dopamine. I mean, Nikola Tesla was flat out manic and had you know obsessive compulsive disorder. So he had some pretty extreme dopamine irregularities. But uh, having modestly elevated dopamine is really valuable for creativity because it, it causes divergent thinking and it also lowers latent inhibition, which means you don't screen out as much stuff and you get more defocused attention and you're incorporating more stimuli than you would normally. So we know that modestly elevated dopamine is related to creativity. And in fact, there was a really interesting thing that happened when I was doing this study. I started this, remember, in 2010, and one of my colleagues came to me and he said, did you hear that they've discovered that when people have Parkinson's, it can open up a whole creative genius thing that they never knew they had. They might become artists or sculptors or whatever. And I thought about it for a minute. And and really quickly, I thought, it's it's not the Parkinson's, it's the levodopa they're giving them because levodopa is synthetic dopamine. And probably when they first get on this levodopa, they've probably got elevated dopamine. And, and sure enough, a few months later, they did another study and they're like, oh, it's the levodopa. <laughs> but um, so I felt very vindicated yeah, in that. No but, <laughs> but this elevated dopamine, elevated dopamine also facilitates working memory and executive function. So this one neurotransmitter that uh, can enhance creativity can also enhance television, uh, television, intelligence and processing. So uh, they have an underlying common basis, right? And it's also the case that when you have uh, long working memory or or even good exceptional long-term memory, you'll follow longer paths of association. You, you are capable of following longer paths of association out. So for instance, Kimball Musk refers to Elon Musk, uh, his brother saying, you know, he's always thinking 10 steps out. So he's arriving somewhere that other people haven't even thought of yet, mm -hmm. right? And, and he turns out to be right. And you would see that he's right if you followed him all 10 steps out. And that's really facilitated by being intelligent. Now that doesn't mean that all creative people are geniuses or that that all geniuses are creative, but it does mean that there are some common elements that help with both. Now, take that modestly elevated dopamine and look at what happens when you make it really extreme, you start getting things like schizophrenia, right? You get mania, you can get obsessive compulsive disorder, um, but uh, schizophrenia, uh, the positive affect schizophrenia, when people have word salad and, and they're gibbering and they are, they're hearing things, that's from having really, really elevated dopamine. So, um, so you can see that connection. Now you can say families that have historically generated more creative geniuses have also historically created more schizophrenics. So we knew about that genetic link long before we understood the neurotransmitters that underlie that connection. Yet again, it, it kind of points to the fact that on some of these serial breakthrough innovators, they might have that characteristic, but it's it's almost like it's the perfect the perfect balance of that right. character, right? Too much, right. and you 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 venture into schizophrenia territory. Too little, and maybe they aren't as as driven to to be so creative and, and wild in their thinking. But uh, yeah. another another thing that you point out is is sleep or lack yeah. thereof, which made me analyze my own sleep. Uh, how, how does their lack of sleep affect their work? Because, you know, some, some of these uh, people, who, who was it that gets two hours of sleep a night? Was that uh, Dean Tesla. Kamen? No, Tesla. No, that was Tesla. So, I mean, th they're getting ridiculously little amounts of sleep on a regular basis compared to right. the average. How are they able to pull that off? Well, this was actually one of the one of the tip offs about the mania and the dopamine irregularities. And again, it's I had never read anything about creative people in sleep. Like 
it's just not a dominant theme in the research on innovation and not a dominant theme in most of the research on creativity I've read either. Uh, but in Nikola Tesla, you couldn't miss it, right? Because he slept yeah. two hours a day if he slept at all. He really didn't sleep. And that's a, you know, a pretty clear, and he wasn't tired, right? So when you have mania, you don't need sleep and you don't feel tired. If you're an insomniac, you don't sleep, but you feel terrible, right? You wish you were sleeping. Uh, but a manic person doesn't feel terrible. They feel great. And this was how Tesla felt. And so it's, it's a, that's a really strong diagnostic, diagnostic criteria of mania, which was kind of the first reason I started looking at him very closely for signs of mania. But then it made me wonder, how much do the other innovators sleep? And I really had to hunt to find this. And I had to dig and dig and find letters and find articles and references. And, and it turns out you can find pretty good sleep information on, on I think, all but maybe one of the innovators. Uh, but here's, here's the rundown. Thomas Edison and Dean Kamen slept about four, well, Dean Kamen still does sleep about four hours a night. Mm -hmm. uh, Benjamin Franklin slept about five hours a night. Marie Curie slept between four and five hours a night. Elon Musk sleeps about six and a half hours a night. Uh, we don't have good data on how much Steve Jobs slept, but he slept irregularly, erratically, people said. And of these innovators, the only one who slept a, a, a good long full night was Albert Einstein, who said he needed 10 hours of sleep a night. So he was the real outlier there. But of all these other people, with Elon Musk at six and a half hours, that's still a couple of hours short of the national average in the United States. And it's a good hour short of of all the developed countries in the world, the one that sleeps the longest on average is Japan, and they sleep seven and a half hours a night. So you've got a group of people here that 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 don't sleep very much. But uh, it's my belief. I don't think not sleeping caused them to be innovative. I think having elevated dopamine caused them to be innovative and caused them to not sleep very much. Yeah, yeah. It gave them the that elevated dopamine gave them the ability to maneuver through that lack of sleep <laughs> successfully yes, exactly. on the other side. Because I'm like the one thing I have in common with Elon Musk six and a hours, uh, six and a half hours of sleep a night. Yeah. So at least I've and got I, I, that. I don't think you should cut down on your sleep thinking it will make you more innovative. <laughs> right. right. That's probably the reverse yeah, of what you should actually do. Uh, speaking of Elon Musk, I think he's kind of the embodiment of the higher purpose idealism uh, part of your book. And actually, Elon Musk is one example, but I feel like Silicon Valley in general we, we hear a lot about this, right? Like what we're doing is going to change the world. You know, they really yeah. feel confident about the fact that their time, their inventions are going to elevate the quality of, of life for the world and beyond. Talk a, right. talk a little bit about how, how Elon Musk kind of, kind of falls into that, uh, about the ideals of these figures, you know, as relates to this higher purpose. Okay, so seven of the eight innovators I studied had this intense idealism. The outlier on this one is Thomas Edison. Mm -hmm. He was not an idealistic person, and he even talked about not being an idealistic person. But the other seven innovators are all extremely idealistic, which again, uh, I you know I knew Steve Jobs was idealistic, and I knew Dean Kamen was idealistic, but I was really surprised by how idealistic all the others were. And in Elon Musk, you know, I. It, it's amazing to study this man because yeah. he, um, you know, he could have retired after the sale of PayPal, right? When he was 28 years old, he had $180 million. He could have just gone and lived on a beach with a mojito in his hand the rest of his life. He didn't need to gamble it all on two incredibly risky, intense ventures. And that's exactly what he did. And basically it came down to this. He didn't need money anymore, but he wanted to work on problems. He's a person who needs to work all the time and he needs to be mentally stimulated all the time. And he asked himself, what does the world need? What would make the biggest difference? And he thought, you know, we are in a uh, on a collision course with disaster because we're using up energy too quickly and we need more sustainable energy solutions. And he sketched out the idea for Solar City and gave that to his cousins to implement and then also started looking around for a way to create an electric car, which is how he ended up with Martin Eberhardt developing the Tesla um, because cars are a, a big consumer of, of fossil fuels and it's liquid fuel, which is, which is harder to replace than other, some other types of energy. So Tesla was a about solving the world's energy problem. But then he also fundamentally believes that it's very likely that some event will happen that will destroy uh, life as we know it on the earth. It's just a probabilistic uh, likelihood. And that the only way to preserve the human species is to have a colony somewhere else, not on earth. <laughs> and so he built SpaceX 
to colonize Mars. And he had to make a very conscious choice not to take that company public because you know he's got 100 million of his own money or more at this point probably now in SpaceX. And at one point he was flat broke because he put all his money into SpaceX and Tesla. I mean, he really put it all into those companies. He had to borrow rent money at the time. He was on the verge of bankruptcy. It was a very difficult time for him. But he really believes in going to Mars and he won't take the company public because he knows a board of directors would probably force him to make compromises that would lower the likelihood of getting to Mars. And so he's not willing to do that. So here's a person who put his own money on the line and uh, you know anyone who thinks that he is in these businesses for the money hasn't been paying attention. Because if you study him very closely, it's very, very clear that he's not in it for the money at this point. He's in it to change the world. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's fascinating to uh, to kind of watch what he comes up with, and you know, and time and time again. It ends up being the oh well that's that's such a grand vision like you could you could who could actually possibly pull that off and yet time to I mean he just he just flew a, a Tesla into orbit whoever saw that coming you know can I say, I want to say something about that because this is such a great example of someone showing you that you shouldn't believe what when other people say something's impossible yeah. when he. He's, he does have an undergraduate degree in physics, but he's not like someone who ha who studied rocket science and has a PhD in rocket science. He's a person who just was upset that NASA wasn't going to take us to Mars and, you know, saw that nobody else was going to do it. So he decides to, you know, roll up his sleeves and says, okay, well, I'll get us to Mars myself and starts reading rocket science textbooks and goes to Russia, tries to buy some rockets and they tell him, no, no, kid, what you want is impossible. And he gets really frustrated by this. In fact, all the whole industry said, look, we've been trying to build reusable rockets for 50 years. It can't be done. It's impossible. If, if anybody could do it, we could do it. This is what the industry told him. Even Neil Armstrong told him he, he was on a fool's errand, and which was very, you know, hurtful. But, um, but he said, eh, I think I can do it. And he came up with his own design for a reusable rocket. A guy who was not from the space industry sketches out his own idea for a reusable rocket and has now demonstrated a reusable rocket. Uh, there's a few stories more inspiring than that one. Yeah, and you put you also point out in the book um, that there is something to be something big. That there's something to the fact that when it comes to disrupting a particular industry or, or a particular way, you know, generally accepted way of doing things, you know, oftentimes it is the newcomer to that industry because right. the establishment uh, within that industry has already kind of accepted the fact that this is just the way that it's done. And there really is no way outside of this to do that. Elon Musk right. comes along, reads a ton of books and proves that you can, you know, land a, land a rocket when everyone else said it was impossible possible. Yep, absolutely. Those assumptions, that training you get in a field, it can become a constraint, right? It can calcify your thinking about something. Yeah. And this is this is exactly what happened with Albert Einstein because he was rejected by academia. You know, when he graduated with his PhD, he hadn't been liked by his professors. He was perceived as inattentive and disrespectful and rebellious and sloppy. And uh, so they wouldn't write letters for him. So nobody would give him an academic post. Uh, but because he wasn't in academia, he didn't have to follow the rules. And, you know, when you're an academic, you generally have to cite, you know, the people who've gone before you. You know who you have to cite in order to get something published and and who to get along with in order to be accepted into the social circles of that field and, and to thus have your work accepted. And he wasn't in the field, so he just didn't. He didn't follow their rules. And that ended up being crucial because some of their rules were holding back that field. Yeah, yeah. Um, finally, uh, driven to work, which I feel like we've we've touched on, you know, throughout. In order to be really successful in the way that these uh, these innovators have, I mean, you got to have that drive, and that comes from somewhere. The question I had about that is about burnout. So, so many of us yeah. would be so hyper focused and driven to to do this thing, but I mean. Everyone in this book that we're talking about they did, th you know, innovation after innovation after innovation, right up to their, you know, the day that they they died, basically, yeah. uh, for for those yeah. who are no longer with us. How how are they able to avoid burnout with that amount of intensity? Yeah, and you know, I want to I want to highlight that there's two major sources of that drive, and uh, 
and Edison ends up being really important for understanding this because I mentioned that seven of those innovators were incredibly idealistic. And idealism is a powerful intrinsic motivator. Right. An intrinsic motivator will keep you focused and motivated. It'll make you work hard because you're working for something that's more important than yourself. So you might go without eating. You might sacrifice your family or your health or even your reputation because you believe you're pursuing something so important that it matters more than whether or not you're happy or comfortable. And so seeing people who are driven when they're idealistic we understand how that works. Edison was not idealistic, so what drove him? And the trait that he has, they all had. It's just that in Edison, you can see it more clearly because he doesn't have the idealism layered on top of it. And that is that he loved to work. He had a really high need for achievement. He felt that feeling of flow when he was pursuing something that was hard. And I, I like to equate him to a border collie because I'm, I'm a dog person. And mm -hmm. <laughs> if you, anyone is a dog person, if you know, a border collie is a dog that loves to herd sheep and it loves to work hard herding sheep. And you don't have to train it. You don't have to reward it because that work is the reward. And it would you know, you have to stop that dog from doing that work. And there's a saying among dog people that if you don't give a border collie a job, it'll find its own job and you won't like it. Yep, yep. So, so they don't make great house pets a lot of the time. They're, they're really working animals. But, you know, Thomas Edison was a border collie. He was a working animal. He was only happy when working and he could work longer and harder than the people around him. And the people he worked with would remark on it and they would say things like, you know, he really can't understand the rest of us. He doesn't have much tolerance for the rest of us because he doesn't have the limits that the rest of us have. And uh, I would love to understand that more. I think there is actually some interesting clues that is just a brand new area of research that's on, it's called... Um, the shorthand, the acronym is NEAT. It stands for Non-Exercise Activity Thermogenesis, I think it is. It's it's a study of the fact that some, it's mostly done in mice. So usually you're looking at mice, animals just naturally utilize and burn and consume more energy than others, even if they're closely related. So there's this line of research that looks at very closely related mice from the same strain. And it looks at how many times they'll turn the wheel in their in their cage, you know, they put an exercise wheel in the cage and it's voluntary exercise. And some mice will, you know, do 14 turns in a wheel voluntarily in a day. And some mice will do 14,000 turns in a wheel. And those same mice will fidget more and they'll groom themselves more and they'll be more aggressive. So there's something that we don't quite understand yet that makes some animals just more active. And I think that that's the kind of animal that Thomas Edison was. I actually think it's the kind of animal that they all were. Uh, you see it in Marie Curie too. She would stay at her bench and she would work until she fainted and she forgot to eat all the time. <laughs> and, and one of her daughter's earliest memories is of her mother fainting at her workbench. Right. Uh, but some people feel this, this urge. And it, this also could be related to dopamine, but I don't think we have the answers on this yet. Yeah, yeah, um, and then and then finally, you you kind of round things out by taking a look at, at the challenges that they face, also the opportunities which we talked about a little bit or, uh, earlier, and their access to resources that would help them. The question yeah. I have though is how we apply this to ourselves because I think a lot of people would probably read through Quirky both from a from a fascinating you know a perspective that's fascinated with these people that that did all of these amazing things, but also how do I take some of those good qualities and apply it to my own life? The question I have there is, do we actually really want this? Like, it, seem, it, seems, it seems really great to be so good at innovating and creating things that you could live a life that is, that is as productive as them. It also kind of seems like there, there are aspects of, of what you lay out that, to a certain degree, depending on who you are, could be very imprisoning to a certain, yeah. to a certain yeah. degree. I mean, a lot of these people had very hard lives. They'd yeah. had, had lives that you wouldn't want, right? That they would make you unhappy. Was Marie Curie's story inspired me and also made me sad. Uh, and even Elon Musk has said sometimes he's not sure he wants his life. Right. Uh, but, but it's who they were. And I think the thing for us to learn here is that a lot of us have some of these traits. And sometimes we resist them because we're afraid of being weird. Um, or we're afraid that maybe it's a sign. Like if we don't like, if, if we struggle in school, maybe we think it's because we're not smart. Maybe we don't realize that it's really that we need to study on our own terms. Uh, so, so the real, I think, takeaway of the book is, is to 
is a better understanding of those things that are in us and how we can cultivate them and nurture them in ways that do make us happy and make us more productive and innovative. Embracing weirdness, for instance, instead of thinking of weird as a trait that we have to get rid of. Uh, or or studying on our own if we don't like the way we have to study things in school. Reading more, reading the things we want to read, feeling like we can do anything we set our minds to. That actually makes you a happier person, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Um, finally, and if you don't mind me asking, I mean, you know, beyond the the topics of the book, a slightly more personal question, and I'm perfectly happy to answer it myself as as a trade off. What did you learn? about yourself most within all the research that you did on this book? Because it's hard, it's hard to read the book and not be very introspective. So I yeah. imagine it's the same from actually doing the research and putting it together. Yeah. Um, wow, I didn't even know you were going to ask that question. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I, learned a, I learned a lot of things. Um, and one of the things I think that has been really incredibly liberating is that... Uh, I grew up very isolated. I grew up in a cabin in the on a mountain in the middle of nowhere because I have a very reclusive mother and she was at work a lot. And so I was just there in the cabin by myself a lot. And I got in the habit of being alone a lot. And I still work alone a lot. And uh, I've always felt this struggle in that I can get really lonely, but I also do tend to isolate myself a lot. And, and I used to beat myself up over it. And I used to think I lack social skills and I really had to work on it and that I wished I was more, I made an effort to, to get out more and do more with more people. I, I really used to beat myself up thinking that I had to be something different. And one thing this book did was it just made me feel okay to be like, no, you know what? This is who I am and this is how I like to work. And, and it's probably the way I work best and I'm just going to accept me. And that was, that was really powerful for me. Absolutely. Um, I would, I would probably say very close to the thing, uh, the same thing as you act, acting more on my own instinct, trusting that your instinct actually comes from somewhere valuable and that, you know, you have an inner voice to not really squash it and, and, yeah. and silence it because, because of that social pressure. It really seems right. like everybody in this book, did, you know, it, for, for all of their quirks, did a really great job of trusting that inner voice and, and realizing that it has value and there's a reason for it. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, thank you for answering that question. It, it, it occurred to me and I was like, oh man, do I ask this? Venturing on a little personal territory, but I'm really happy that I asked it because I think a lot of people that would read through uh, Quirky would probably come up with very similar uh, analysis of their own lives. And that's, I think, what yes. makes it such a, such a successful uh, read and so fascinating, both from a history perspective, like I said, but also from from a way of analyzing, you know, your own traits and learning more about you. Uh, Quirky, the remarkable story of the traits, foibles, and genius of breakthrough innovators who changed the world. And uh, Melissa Schilling, really appreciate you taking the time uh, to talk with me today about your awesome book. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. This was really fun. Absolutely. And uh, of course, you can find Quirky, uh, you know, go to Amazon or your local bookstore if there is a brick and mortar bookstore uh, <laughs> now. I'm sure you can find it there, too. Uh, thanks again, Melissa. We'll talk to you soon and best of luck. Thank you. All right. Uh, this is Triangulation. We do this show every Friday. Normally, we record this every Friday at 6 p.m. Eastern, 3 p.m. Uh, Pacific, 2200 UTC. This actually recording was a little bit earlier in the day, but you'll still get it in your feed. If you're subscribed, just go to twit.tv slash TRI or twit.tv slash triangulation and you can subscribe to the show. You can find all the links, all the different past episodes, the fascinating people that we've interviewed uh, in previous episodes. There's a lot to dive into there. So if you're just getting started, you've got a lot of catching up to do. Uh, I'm Jason Howell and I really appreciate the opportunity to do this. Thanks to our producer and TD Carson uh, for setting all this up and making it uh, so enjoyable. And thanks to you for watching. We'll see you all next week on another episode of Triangulation. Bye, everybody.